Okay, everyone, I just wanted to explain what's going on. Sorry, had an echo there. Uh, Fraser uh, bought a new computer. The new computer said, no, I will not. Um, so he is switching to his old computer. For now, you have just me. Um, so I'm monitoring both Twitch and YouTube. Feel free to ask me questions while we wait for the old computer to be retrieved and booted up and join the chat. Um, for now, I'm here. Hello over on Twitch. Not the brain, existential squee, keeper of maps, Ruben, broken symmetry, myth town. Thank you all for being here. And hello over on YouTube to Kim Barron, Zap Van Zap Fan. Uh, John Suffin, um, it's not letting me scroll any higher up, so if you've said hello, I'm sorry, I'm having a moment of fail. Um, just like I said, I'm waiting for Fraser to join, um, but I'm monitoring everything. So, um, yeah, sometimes new computers are just like, no, I hate everything. I shall not. And that is definitely what we're dealing with today. Hello, Mrs. Nat. Hello. Um, hello, Ian. Hello, Misadventures in Astro. We've got a good group here. Just to repeat again, uh, Fraser is trying to sort out uh, computer issues. The doggos are great. Um, I don't think there's any in the room right now. Stella was here earlier. Um, Fraser didn't get a new router modem, whatever. He got a new computer and the computer is what said no. Um, Alan Gross says, uh, is it my imagination or you, do you just seem more animated since you've recovered from your surgery? I've heard that from multiple people. And I mean, to be honest, I hadn't realized just how unwell I was until I was not that unwell. So yes, yes. Uh, it turns out uh, not having a gallbladder was in my favor, except when I want to eat. Um, so Fraser is back. I'm waiting to see if I can hear him. Can't hear him. Um... All right, let's see. You can now see Fraser. We can't hear Fraser. Let's see if something comes back. Audio hardware is not our friend, even after 17 years. Hello, Ironheart50. Hello, Guido. What's for dinner? Yeah. <laughs> Guido's just stopping by. Does it work now? Oh, I'm sorry that your gallbladder is mimicking, not the brain. Gallbladders are assholes. Are you not? Um, John Selfield uh, Suffle asks, why is Enceladus a better hope for ET life than Europa? It's not a better hope. It's a easier to sense because uh, it has more reliable geysers. Um, you hear Fraser? I don't. I don't hear Fraser. Fraser's. They hear me, but you don't. I still can't hear you. What is going on? Why? Well Why then. is it so full of fail? Why mm, all the to, fail? I switched a computer for you. Wait. Now the chat. Say something, Fraser. Can you hear me? The audience can hear you. I can't. One moment. Why? Why? Say something, Fraser? Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're now on my computer speaker. So apparently my headphones died. Let me fix that. One moment. Um, 
say something? Can you hear me now? Okay, so that's only going to the audience. Why did my headphones die? They worked on a telecom, telecom an hour ago. Let me play with my computer settings. Um... Um, okay, apparently we're just going to have all the difficulties today. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, let's send all my audio to right there. Say can you hear me now? On my computer speakers, now try. Can you hear me now? No, no, I cannot. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I have you on my computer speakers. Uh, let me be confused for a moment. Why would that not work? I'm apparently very quiet. I'm getting audio from somewhere very far away. Is it not this? No, it is that. Yeah, it should be that. Oh, the echo is very faint. Yeah, the echo is because to hear him, he's currently on my external speakers and I'm trying to figure out how to fix that. So um, I don't hear an echo. So they hear an echo. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I need to figure out why my headphones stopped working. Um, that worked an hour ago in a telecon. Um, Okay, so I have that going out there. Say something. Can you hear me now? Nope. All right, so what can I do? Put in different headphones? Yeah. That's probably going to require running up and down the stairs. I'm looking to see if I can just plug my headphones in somewhere. Let me plug them in directly and see. This is just a bizarre problem we've never had before. Mm -hmm. um. I was all ready to accept the blame with my new computer, but... Well, before you didn't have any audio going out to the stream either, so... Mm, okay, all right. Because now I can see your levels, which is why I know to be confused. Say something? I can yeah. hear you. Yes. So apparently it was just that one port was like, I will not let you hear. All right. I'm not going to try and figure it out. It's working now. Let me turn you up for the audience. All right. Mares eat oats. Fraser, what do you eat? Uh, oatmeal. I guess. Okay, you're still soft. Let me try turning you up more. Say something interesting. Can you hear me now? Interesting things. Your microphone is glowing different color. That's weird. <laughs> yes, it's good that way. Um, I think we're just going to have to live with these these uh, levels. I'm sorry about that. Fraser shouldn't still be echoing. There's nothing to cause Fraser to echo anymore. Is it possible that my audio is going out to separate channels somehow? No. OK. 
है Okay, I'm gonna stick. I can't. Oh, Hal McKinney is saying it's better, so I'm guessing you sorted it. Okay, okay, so we're good. We're good. All right. You got a new computer, though. What did you get? I got a MacBook Pro. That is excellent. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I spent so much time on the thing. I figured I might as well get a proper MacBook Pro. So it's so it's faster for doing like video rendering, yeah, things like that. It's able to handle doing live streams. Um, okay, new audio recording. Make sure I got the right device. I didn't. Now I do. Okay, all right. I'm ready to record. You're ready to record. I am. I am pressing record. I am pressing record. All the records have been pressed. Astronomy Cast, episode 701. Space science we look forward to in the next 700 episodes. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly fact space journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I, I am doing well. I, I just had the realization that we will be well over the retirement age when we hit uh, episode 1400. But right. somehow, given the current economy, we'll still be podcasting. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll still be waiting for traditional media to finally give up the ghost. It's true. Um, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. And to think how young we were. I know. When we started. We were babies. Yeah. Early 30s, I guess. Yeah. And now early 50s for me. <laughs> I turned 50 on Saturday. No, oh, great. Okay, Tuesday. I turned 50 on Tuesday. Right. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. We will, we will both be now entering that uh, fifth decade. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you do when you, that's what happens when you make 700 thing on a relatively weekly basis. You yeah. just get old. It's, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, last week, <laughs> we looked back at some of the ideas that science has changed its mind about. Then... We look forward into the future at some of the big ideas that astronomers are making progress in. What space science are we looking forward to? And we will talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right, Pamela, 700 episodes. Uh, I guess, are, are we going to predict with perfect accuracy all no. of the major science that will be discovered within the next 700 episodes within the next roughly 15 years of our lives no but i'm hoping we might make predictions on at least the things that funding to solve ends up getting dedicated okay. to yeah yeah i mean there is this chain right where you get the a mystery appears scientists identify the mystery scientists come together and meet and describe what kinds of things need to be built to help uncover the mystery the thing gets built the mystery gets solved and also generates more mystery that is the that's the life cycle yeah 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 uh and so i guess what do you use to to target the to know what the astronomers what mysteries the astronomers are hoping to solve well, I mean, at a, at a certain level on the decade by decade, it's the decadal survey. We're now far enough into this decade that, that we have a survey, we have diverged from the survey, but we have not yet started on the next survey. So right. we're in a no man's land of getting to just guess what we're hoping comes next. And no one can go further than a decade out in a field where such weird, strange new stuff is regularly discovered. And that's part of what makes it exciting. So for, I guess, for people who aren't familiar with the decadal survey, what is yeah. it? Uh, roughly every 10 years, the astronomical uh, community and the planetary society 
planetary science community separately get together, form a whole variety of committees, and work to determine what are the most significant problems in our field today that we have the ability to make breakthroughs on. And it's this survey that is normally administered out of the National Academy of Sciences that is then used to if we're lucky, govern where funding is dedicated for the next 10 years, um, it's, it's a way of basically prioritizing things. So we're looking to prioritize, for instance, figuring out what dark energy is. And this is where we see the Nancy Grace Roman telescope is, is not going to be allowed to fall asunder. It shall be done because this right. is how we get to dark energy and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Um, it's, it's also part of where Mars just keeps staying in the priority list, but Venus made its way in there as well. Um, the outer planets made it in, but didn't get nearly enough love. They never do. Uh, so this is, this is our guiding documents on how not as one individual working as chief scientist or director of the NSF community, but as a profession how do we figure out where to go next? All right, so let's talk about the the planetary stuff, the, like the stuff within the solar system first. What are the big scientific questions that astronomers are hoping to make progress on within I, the solar system? I think the biggest question that would make everybody happy is where does and has life existed in our solar system? <laughs> yes, please. And and this means more exploration of Titan, more exploration of Enceladus and Europa, more exploration of Mars. And Venus is at play as well. It's just wildly different and far more enigmatic. So we have these suites of worlds that we just don't understand nearly well enough where all these liquid, so life requires three things, a solvent, uh, an energy uh, gradient, and nutrients. And Titan has methane, ethane as its solvent in triple point liquid, solid, uh, vapor. Um, then Enceladus, Europa, uh, both have water. Uh, Mars previously had water, Venus previously had water, and currently has chaos. Um, and and so, so the question becomes, can we find life in some form existing on those three moons of gas giants? And can we find hot fossils on Mars? And can we figure out how to get to the surface of Venus and live there long enough to figure out anything? And what is being done to try to get answers to these questions? So we currently have the Europa Clipper that is being uh, constructed to go to Europa, do a series of imaging and uh, hopefully orbiting uh, successfully and maybe getting some samples of geysers that spew stuff into the air. We don't currently have anything on the books to go to Enceladus, but we do have Dragonfly that is slated to go to Titan. So that's two of the three moons. On Mars, we're working on gathering samples and the Mars sample return mission has become the great vacuum is, that is starting to uh, eat all funding within NASA for planetary science. And uh, if successful, it will bring rocks back to Earth where our significantly larger and more energy intensive laboratories can look for the stuff of life, including things like fossilized lipids, which is now something we have the ability to do. Um, and Venus, there are maybe three, definitely two missions slated to go there and uh, better explore its atmosphere and its surface through a myriad of different uh, technologies. Yeah, we're at a bit of a tricky time with yeah. the Mars sample return mission. Uh, it looks like it's going to cost more than anybody was expecting. And as we saw with James Webb, we don't like missions to eat all of the funding. 
And so right now it looks like they're going to go through more reviews and try to get a sense, you know, how do they bring the cost? Yeah. Down. But, but half of the Mars sample return mission is already underway, which is Perseverance right. collecting all of the samples to be able to meet up with the Mars sample return mission and be able to deliver the samples home. Uh, the Chinese are planning their version of the yeah. Mars sample return mission. So even if NASA and ESA don't do it, we will see samples return from Mars probably by 2030. And so hopefully, but, but it's not going to be as comprehensive a set. It's going to be whatever the lander and maybe a helicopter or two can gather up in the vicinity around the lander while Perseverance is taking a decade to stop and smell the roses, as it were, and you know grab samples from lots of really interesting different rocks and, and go from there. So um, do you think within the next 700 episodes, we'll have an answer to this question, is there life elsewhere in the solar system? I really hope so. I, I think there is the potential that if they're able to sufficiently grab stuff from the geysers, if we get really lucky, the microscope might be able to see something in the ices. Um, I think there's the potential to find fossils on Mars. Lord only knows what dragonfly we'll see on Titan. Mm -hmm. That is perhaps the most uh, open-ended question. And I just hope that uh, missions like Mars Sample Return don't eat so much funding that there's no scientists left to look at the data. Um, because inevitably, whenever there are cost overruns, where it comes out of is in the, sci in the science funding available to independent researchers. And without independent researchers, the field just shrinks, just shrinks. Now, you mentioned, you know, the hunt for life on Mars, yeah. on Europa, Titan, maybe. Yeah. Um, but a lot of other work is going to be going into studying Venus. So what are the yes. big scientific questions that we're trying to get answered about Venus? There are so many where to start. Uh, Venus is really an under-researched world because it is very mean to spacecraft and it's not entirely easy to get to. Um, so, so there's everything from the great phosphine debacle that I'm not sure is going to end until we have a mission orbiting to say whether or not there's phosphine. There's the what is this black sooty stuff that we keep seeing in the atmosphere. There is the is there active volcanism today or not question. There is the what caused Venus to have a runaway greenhouse effect and there's always that back of the mind concern of can that happen here? How do we avoid it? Right. Um, and and so with Venus, it's really what was the past environment? What catastrophe led it to be what it is today? And and what is it today beneath all that cloud cover? And does anything live in that cloud cover? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So pick a starting point. It's all, kind of exciting. Yeah, all good questions. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, those are kind of the big ones. But I mean, there is a fleet of spacecraft headed towards the sun. There's big questions about the sun that are, we're hoping to have answered. What would Be you say is like the biggest question about the sun that we still don't really have an answer to? Oh, man. I, mean, I do think... Do we know why the corona is so hot yet? Is that like... I don't that know. One? That depends on if you believe any of the papers. Honestly, though, I think there's no one scientific thing so much today as the ability to predict space weather. As, as we mm. launch more and more small sats and LEO sats for communications that we l rely on into low Earth orbit, it's important that we know where the atmosphere is. There was already one entire batch of Starlinks that got consumed when our atmosphere was hit by uh, solar energy. It expanded out. Those satellites were suddenly under a lot more drag than they were prepared for, and no more batch of Starlinks. And yeah. there are plenty of Starlinks where those came from, but that's not true for a university project that launches as a CubeSat. It's not true for so many other things. And folks are trying really hard to figure out how to predict solar behaviors so we can move things ahead of time, so we can lock things down into safe mode ahead of time, and 
all these things are going to be necessary uh, to prevent a, a Leo catastrophe because every time our atmosphere moves, it moves all the satellites, which makes it harder to predict their locations, which me makes it easier for them to collide. And we need space weather. And like one of the greatest threats that we face as a civilization has gone and connected all of our modern devices together into these giant electrical grids. We've launched satellites is to be able to handle and weather space weather. Yeah, and yeah. The more we can understand the sun, the more we can get some kind of notice. Yeah. And that is like the prediction system is the thing that's being built. And like right now we get like 30 minutes notice. Maybe we can get up to an hour's notice. Like that is the goal is to get more and more notice so that you yeah. can calmly and quietly disconnect parts of the network, shift things offline, wait for the solar storm to pass, put everything back together. Transfer orbits have, in some cases. <laughs> yeah, and not have to be like putting, you know, I guess being driven back to the Stone Age in the worst possible way. Right. Scenario. And right, we're going to talk. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, and even just sometimes delaying launches could be useful. We just need yeah. that five days warning. Yeah, five days. Oh, can you imagine? To dream. Right, we're going to talk about the Milky Way next, but first, it's time for another break. And we're back. All right, so let's expand our knowledge and let's look out into the Milky Way. What are the big scientific questions that we're going to be trying to answer? Let me guess. Exoplanets? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think it's a one-two punch of exoplanets will make one side of the community happy and better understanding the supermassive black hole in the region around it will make the rest of the community happy. Uh, so on the exoplanets front, I think the, the, the two things are going to again be, is there life out there? Where are there atmospheres? Where are there habitable worlds? Um, but there's also like weird questions like why the heck are we not finding planets between about 1.5 and 2.5 Earth masses in size? We do not understand planet formation the way we would like to understand planet formation. I, I, the more systems we see, the more spectroscopy we get, the more likely we are to both understand solar system formation and figure out where, if anywhere, are there the possibilities of life and potentially civilizations. I mean, it is really amazing how we are now in the 5,500-ish range in yeah. exoplanets known with thousands and thousands more yeah. candidates that are still being studied. So we probably know of more than 10,000 exoplanets at this point. And Think back to like 1995 when they found the first. The exoplanet. first planet around a normal Orbiting star. Orbiting around a sun-like star, yes, not yeah. around a neutron star, a pulsar. <laughs> uh, well, so the pulsar one makes us 30 years in, and that's just kind of cool. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, but it's funny that you always have to say that. But yes, fine. Um, but, but, and yet here we are, 10,000 planets. And, and the, I mean, the real revolution now is examining their atmospheres. Taking, you know, originally this work was done with Spitzer on a couple of planets. You yeah. had a bit of some ground-based observatories, but really, it's James Webb is has been looking at a lot of planets so far, and it's been able to find carbon dioxide, methane, uh, silicon oxide. It's been able to find uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, just all of these chemicals, water yeah. vapor, all these chemicals in the atmospheres of planets. And it's moving us towards eventually we will have we will know about the atmospheres of thousands of exoplanets and then we'll get into this realm where where we don't think about planets as one thing you know think about how we feel about trees right <laughs> like we don't we don't name each tree and and remember that time when we found one more tree we think about <laughs> trees in aggregate and that's what we're getting with exoplanets we're going to be thinking about exoplanets in aggregate and and there will always be the special planets the way there are special trees like methuselah and that one american chestnut that they refuse to reveal the position of for very good reasons there will always be special trees and special planets but we do really need to understand the health of the forest and that's yeah. where we're at yeah, yeah but i'm saying we don't name them 
There's no campaign to name every single tree. No, 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 no. And there, and then, so when you think about planets, like I know it's mind bending to think <laughs> that an entire world, yeah, just anonymous. There's a bunch of them. Who cares? Lots. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So we talked about exoplanets, and I mean, obviously, like, like the thing that we hope to find in our next 700 episodes is that Earth-sized world orbiting around a sun-like star in a habitable zone. Yeah. What is our best shot at doing that, at finding that? Oh, man. So right now, missions are working on, on complex, basically, find it with something like TESS that's using the transient method, and then do follow-up observations with uh, JWST or, I just blanked on the European mission. It begins Area. with the letter C. Oh, Cheops. Is, Cheops. I mean, Cheops is, yeah, Cheops is more about It's a follow-up. It's for categorizing the transit and not yeah. the atmosphere. But yeah, yeah, an aerial which launches in 2028 is going to do the atmospheres. And, and through this combination of categorizing what the orbit is, it gives us the ability to then say, these are the ones we need to follow up more. And as we build up the data, hopefully we're going to start to figure out if you want to find rocky planets, you look in these kinds of areas in the galaxy. Um, the best we can do right now is assume it's going to be someplace like where we are and around. A, yeah, it's we just have to find and look. It's it's like panning for gold, except we're panning for planets. Just keep panning until you get there. I mean, the tragedy is that the, the machine that would have done it was Kepler. Yeah. And Kepler wasn't able to fulfill its mission. We need a and new so Kepler. We need a new Kepler. And then and there's sort of there's the Earth-based version of that, yeah. which is going to be the extremely large telescope, which should theoretically be able to distinguish Earth-sized worlds orbiting around sun-like stars, maybe. Um, but the one that's really going to do it is the Habitable Worlds Observatory, and this is going to be the follow-on to JWST. You know, this is what Louvoir was after you yeah. took Habex and mashed it together with Louvoir, and you get this, the HWO. Yeah, and the extremely oh, large telescope is having funding issues as well. So, as always, money is the thing that keeps getting in the way of these telescopes. But, but like, we can't guarantee that anybody will find this. Yeah, world yeah, within it's that true. next seven hundred episodes. Yeah, which is kind of sad. But the but just like the machine, so the closest you're going to get is with the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which launches in 27 and it will have the ability to distinguish jupiter-sized worlds at jupiter's orbits around sun-like stars yeah but you need two orders of magnitude more powerful a um a sort of ability to distinguish between the star and its planet before you get to earth-sized worlds sun-like star and that's the plan with the habitable worlds observatory so unfortunately, not there yet. All right. And you talked about the center of the Milky Way. Yes. So so we are now starting to find massive star forming regions in the core that we didn't know about. And in fact, 20 years ago, we would have been taught there isn't that kind of star formation. There are these blobs of gassy mush that are getting destroyed as they orbit. We want to understand that process. Uh, it's... There's just details of, uh, we are overly curious about black holes as human beings. It's just who we are. And the idea that our galaxy's black hole periodically eats things and we can see things orbiting it. And do we get to see any of them get eaten? That would be cool. Do we get to see any of them get completely disrupted? That would be cool. Can we backtrace the history of the galaxy and figure out what got destroyed when it blew these x-ray bu bubbles in the past there's there's a whole lot of just we we want to know because it's cool because mm -hmm. there's a black hole and it's really big and it's nearby um and sometimes that's enough to justify science all right we're going to expand our minds out to the rest of the universe but it's time for another break
and we're back. All right, let's think about the entire universe now. Out beyond the galaxy, what are the big scientific questions that astronomers are hoping to answer? Uh, what mixture of only dark matter or dark matter and mond is required to explain everything we see at a distance? Right. Uh, what the heck is dark energy and is it actually necessary and does it predate the formation of black holes and what the F with these two things that make up the majority of our universe and refuse to be directly detected. Um, and then tied in with that, because you have to understand dark energy and dark matter to get at the rate at which structures form is how do we explain the rate at which structures seem to form? Mm -hmm. um, so essentially the story of how do you get from the formation of the cosmic microwave background to our galaxy as it is today and the large scale structure around us as it is today, how do you connect those two points through history? We know what happens, the when of it is where we're currently foiled and figuring out the timeline of structure formation yeah, that that it's all one piece and it's a messy puzzle to put it together and we are putting together an invisible puzzle. Right. And and I think that you know, the James Webb's job, main job is to see those building blocks of galaxies yeah. coming together early on in the universe and we've got exquisite analysis of the cosmic microwave background radiation, but you've got this gap in between those two observations, this age of reionization, the dark ages. Yeah. And right now there are new telescopes coming online, radio telescopes that are going to attempt to probe that time in the universe and fill that gap. And so hopefully we will then have a contiguous understanding of the universe from the cosmic microwave background through the dark ages, through the age of reionization, through that the first galaxies coming together and into the yeah. modern evolution of the universe that we see today. The square kilometer array will come online in our next 700 episodes, one would yeah. hope. Yeah, they started planning years. it before we started this show. That's true. Um, and, and the cool thing is we don't even know what it's going to discover that we aren't creative enough to dream of. Yeah. And knowing that the square kilometer array is coming online, knowing that there's going to be the the Nancy Grace Roman that has essentially the size of Hubble and modern technology mounted on it, we're going to start seeing things that we just hadn't imagined. And then LSST is going to give us spatial and time coverage that, that like Gaia has hinted at what is possible as it did its astrometry and so much science fell out along the way. LSST is going to take what Gaia has been accomplishing and make Gaia look lazy, except for astrometry. And that's just well, amazing to dream about. And of course, after Gaia comes Gaia near. Yes. So they're, they're already planning the next phase of Gaia, which will be Gaia near infrared, which is going to be amazing. So stay tuned. I mean, so many cool <laughs> missions coming out. And then, you know, but unfortunately, some of these won't answer the questions until our next seven. Yeah. Episodes, the one we're in the 1400 to 2100 stretch. That's, you know, that's when we'll get the next. We'll do this show again in 700 episodes. I promise. So as, as you look ahead toward the future, what is the one result that you most want to see occur while we're still kicking around to report on it? Well, I mean, I want to see the analysis of of a planet from the Habitable Worlds Observatory. I think that would be that would be great. Although I think I do also think it's going to be probably disappointing. Like, like it will be inconclusive. They'll say we found oxygen and ozone and methane and all this in an atmosphere and and scientists will go yeah you could get that with rocks so so i don't know i don't know i think 
the one that will be really interesting and very meaningful was, and it, it, this will come very quickly, is when you get Nancy Grace Roman working with Vera Rubin, working with Euclid, which is this European Space Agency mission, those three are going to cate categorize and characterize dark matter and dark energy yeah. to the nth degree. And we will yeah. have a lot of understanding questions. And so if we don't get an answer, we will at least understand the problem so much better. And I think that will be inevitable and very meaningful and worthwhile to our understanding of our place in the cosmos. Because it is weird that we are in this time that we don't understand 90% of the cosmos. Like we can't even detect it. Like we don't know what it is. So that's weird. Thanks, Pamela. Week. Thank you, Fraser. And thank you to all of you out there who make our show possible. And um, I just want to remind you, if you're looking for a tax deduction at the end of the year, we're here as a nonprofit. I had someone reach out last week. Uh, Fred, if you're out there anywhere, thank you. Uh, finding out just what it takes to avoid tax penalties and help us be more successful. Um, this week, though, I'm just going to thank all of the folks that give through Patreon. And I'd like to thank Jordan Young, Stephen Veit, uh, Jeanette Wink, Bore Andre Levsvol, uh, Segi Kemmler, Andrew Palestra, Ed, Boogie Net, Brian Cagle, David Trogue, Gerhard Schweitzer, David, Buzz Parsect, Zero Chill, Laura Kettleson, Robert Plasma, Joe Holstein, Richard Drum, Les Howard, Adam Annis Brown, Gordon Dewis, Alexis Wanderer, M101, Felix Goot, Kim Barron, Astro Sets, William Andrews, Gold, and Roland Vormerdam. Thank you all so very much. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs> bye bye. And then they saved. My trackpad died in the middle of the episode, so I'm now using a much louder track ball that I have for playing Minecraft. So sorry about all the frantic mousing noises you're hearing, everyone. <laughs> Technology fail. Yeah, yeah, I need to figure out. There's something I can use to charge it. Let's charge the trackpad. All right. So. Do I have access to, okay, so, okay, good, all right. <laughs> Hex points out, Fraser mentioned in passing how a sufficiently large solar flare could send us back to the Stone Age. It's it's always amazing how like we're just like so used to these concepts that we just mention complete destruction of technology as we know it as just a side yeah. effect. Don't upload yeah. while we're doing yeah. this. Your Fine. <laughs> I Bad just, you it. suddenly turned into a bunch of checkboxes. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. No problem. Uh, just got to remember to do it. Um, yeah, we are woefully unprepared for a solar storm. And so imagine if the world, imagine if the solar, the, the electricity grid on the hemisphere of the Earth that faces the sun went offline for a month yeah man everybody's power went out together for a month what would that do so um you know and and, and you know to be fair government state agencies groups are are thinking about this yeah uh, there's now uh, noaa has a warning system that's built mm -hmm. into phones so if there's a really powerful solar flare they can send a warning to people in the u.s uh, you know, other countries are coming on board as well. The power companies are building in ways to disconnect parts of the network. But, but at the same time, like imagine you, you have the possibility that a big solar flare is coming and you send yeah. out your crew to all the key points of the power grid and you take the power grid offline. Yeah. Or, I don't know, the day. Like, and people aren't and let's happy about that either. Let's explain this for a second. So, so what happens is 
when the Earth's magnetic field gets struck by all of the particles coming from the sun, it oscillates. An oscillating magnetic field generates current and having excess current on the already stretched to capacity power grid uh, causes added resistance in the cables and the cables can melt, they can sag, they can catch on fire. Explode transformers can explode and we have seen these things happen before mm -hmm. now if you remove all of the human added power from the power grid there will still be solar flare induced electricity but it shouldn't cause massive carnage and destruction um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. we hope <laughs> so, I mean, that is the thing, that is the, the nightmare that we potentially face. Yeah. And when you think about how the telegraph lines caught on fire during the Carrington event. Yeah. Right. That's because excessive charge was being driven through the lines. And that was a nascent mm -hmm. networking of society. And yeah. so it's not like every single electrical device is going to bzzz and die. It's just the more things are connected, you're going to have, as you say, parts of the grid that are overloaded, underloaded, yeah. and you're going to have these these charges going back and forth when it's already at capacity. Yeah. That's when you start to see things break down. And you know, a transformer going down, those are can be million dollar mm -hmm. devices. Yeah. That you don't, you know, the power company just doesn't just have a bunch of them kicking around ready to replace. They have to go and get bring a new one in and swap it out and and who knows so yeah <clears throat> yeah and overloading all of the circuits can also cause home fires can cause like the effects of lightning bolt striking your house yeah 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 so switching topics uh brooke uh brooke in the youtube tr tr blech, starting words over brooke in the youtube chat uh asks, uh, what kind of astrophysical events produce the longest radio waves? So the very longest, hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know I'm, either. I know that active galaxies produce across all wavelengths. Cold gas would be so, long wavelengths. Uh, yeah, like would it be like the 21 centimeter line well there's going to be molecules that are even longer than that yeah. so i I'd, I'd say cold molecules of some sort um but i don't know i don't know i'm looking Got up low far targets yeah yeah like low far is the way to do it um because so galaxy clusters and 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 with the red shifting so like how james webb yeah. is looking at the but was visible now in the infrared, low far, for example, is looking at stuff that was maybe once infrared and is now pushed way out into the radio. Um, yeah. So they, but they can be bigger than the planet. Yeah. But so you it's can... really a question of how big you were able to make your radio telescope. And, and the nice thing is, it's not as efficient, but you can detect like a quarter wavelength and things like that with your, mm -hmm. but it's still not ideal. You want multiple wavelengths, not a fraction of a wavelength across your detector. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't see a great answer right away. Yeah, I don't either. Apologies things to learn um, loud trackball sorry about that everyone <laughs> uh, how many can he asks I'd like to see a Google Maps like UI lets you see all the different frequency renderings from all the different sky surveys spanning all timestamps up to and including near live feed that would be worldwide great. telescope is the closest yeah we the have. worldwide telescope is probably the closest version of that is, is that is that microsoft it that? was microsoft it's now the american astronomical society has acquired it okay all right 
It's maintained, I think, by Alyssa, Alyssa Goodman's group out of Harvard. And you can also do stuff with the European Southern Observatory where you can browse the sky with a map and then you can find objects in the sky and then you can pull up archival data from the European Southern Observatory on any one of those objects and it's sort of a really kind of cool mm -hmm. interactive way. But the files you get are these gigantic yeah. FITS files that give you FITS attempting yeah. to process them. Yes. Sorry to yawn. Zapfan Zapfan says LOFAR goes all the way down to 30 megahertz. Below that, the ionosphere blocks the waves. Yeah. There you go. That's interesting. Um, any questions over on? No, they're still discussing the, uh, uh, will we actually get all the way to the Stone Age or will we have everything back online a month later? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. We, I mean, we, these are the kinds of, like, hopefully our new technology will become the solution as well. Like, yeah. when you have solar panels on your roof and you can power your house and charge your car and you can even do this even when the power goes out in your area, you are now immune to the effect of a giant solar storm. Unless, yeah. like, somehow some part of your house gets fried. But you're largely safe. And so you can imagine that we move from these giant overloaded grids to much smaller, more redundant, more parallel based systems with, yeah. with, with storage happening all the way across the system. And that is kind of the inevitable outcome from shifting towards renewable power because you have to have all this load balancing times when the sun is up, when the wind is up, you know, or the wind is down and times when the sun is down and the wind is up, then you need to be able to switch these different systems. So you need to be able to store power over here and then use it over there, use water storage. Like there's a lot of these ideas as opposed to just one big coal fired power plant that's supplying power to the entire city. If it goes down, then nobody has power. When it comes back online, everybody has power. And we're moving to this place where, I mean, even now, you, pretty much every single part of the U.S., the cheapest form of power is solar yeah so you literally have to hate money to not install solar power to not use solar power to, well to, to so the something else the other side of it is the initial buy-in cost it's it's the ultimate uh terry pratchett problem of it takes a whole lot of money to save money um because the poor person has to buy the cheap boots that have to be repaired over and over and over, whereas the wealthy person can buy the boots that last for decades. Right, but no, like if a, it's not on an individual level. Like if your city wants to get power, then yeah. they're going to take out some kind of long-term loan. They're going to build some kind of energy infrastructure to supply part of the city. And the one that is cheaper is solar power. Yeah, no, here it's just commercial interests. Right, right, but uh, like, like if your city is, mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever it is, whether it's your, your, your power system, like, mm -hmm. like from beginning to end, soup to nuts, total buy-in, total price per kilowatt hour, it's cheaper to go with solar than it is to go with any other form of power generation in every market in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, it's really, you know, so you literally, again, I said you have to hate money. And, and and corporations love money. So, yeah, but yeah, they'd rather money. just keep charging us for the factories that generate power that already exist than put in solar. Oh, no, for sure. No, I'm yeah. saying, but like if they need to build a new station, if they need to yeah. provide more power, it makes no financial sense for them to build a new coal power plant, natural gas power plant, compared to yeah. installing more solar. That's all. Yeah, I think right now a lot of them are aiming towards uh, wind because it is harder to destroy a wind turbine than a solar panel still. Um, hmm. There was a story over the weekend of a solar farm that was destroyed by a hailstorm. So we need to figure that out. <clears throat> Lionel asks, where are the mythical U.S. cities that have done the investing in solar? Well, I yeah. mean, this is like the solar prices have only come down to this level within the last couple of years. So the switchover happened just like 
2023, 2022. And so it takes time for people to, to like purchase and install the, the cheaper solution. Yeah. What, what's frustrating here is we are seeing places where they're making it. So like here in Illinois, we actually have incentives to install uh, solar power on your own house. Um, but in other places, there's actually like, if you do X, Y, and Z, there's going to be penalties. So I just don't understand capitalism. I'm just going to end it there. I don't understand. Yeah, again, it's just people, you know, it's, it's entrenched interests. People hate money. Yeah. Um, but you can't, it can't survive to the economic forces because other people are going to, like if, if in Illinois, they refuse to install solar installations, no problem. What it, you know, whatever the next state over, they'll go hog wild and they'll sell excess power to Illinois at a cheaper price. So there's just, you know, you can trust corporations to, like up until this point, it was more expensive to live your life on renewable power. It was sort of like, yeah. you, know, you had to pay a price to be good. But now you have to pay a price to be bad. And so there's just no incentive to do that. And so that is the thing that gives me a ton of hope now is that the, what is the, the thing that corporate is aligns with corporation corporations, interest, making money, delivering value to shareholders aligns with what is the lower footprint on planet earth? What is sort of better health, for the people in the environment? I mean, it's crazy when you hear how many people die every year from air pollution problems. Oh, I know. Because of I know. coal and gas yeah. and stuff. Like it's, Tens of millions of people die yeah. prematurely because of the pollution from our power systems yeah. and vehicles and so on. So. Anyway, we've reached the end of our hour, so uh, <laughs> we should wrap things up, although we, you know, we had a disastrous first uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> and um, we ended on a rather down note. <laughs> no way. I just told you that everything was going to be fine because now corporations are, are aligned with, uh, with environmentalism. So everything's going to be fine. It's going to be great. <laughs> All right. So what do you have um, going on this week? Uh, so I got an interview shortly. We've got, of course, my question show tonight. Um, and then I got a bunch of hikes in uh, uh, Saguaro National Park. That is Fine. excellent. Yeah. I hope you see a bobcat. Yes, I do too. That sounds yeah, great. that would be amazing. Yeah. Actually, I, what I really want to see is a roadrunner. That's, oh. that's the thing that I've never seen and, and the they're around here apparently yeah yeah i've never seen a roadrunner and that i think there's great. more in new mexico but yeah they're around there yeah yeah and apparently they're a giant cuckoo that oh. i didn't know i know I that they know like either. to eat lizards and run on walls yeah. that's yeah. what i know yeah that's amazing um all right uh let's find things out so thank you everyone for joining us this week. Thanks in advance to the editors and producers who have to deal with this nonsense that we're sending your way. Um, <laughs> we will see all of you on next week. Thanks, Sounds good.